always the dilettante that Mario, on this 11th episode of Good Intentions. Before Mario was Mario, he went by the name Jumpman. But even before he adopted that brief moniker, he was known to his creator Shigeru Miyamoto simply as Mr. Video. The idea behind Mr. Video was a simple and straightforward one. He would be a versatile, all-purpose character, adaptable into all genres and all styles of play. That concept ultimately found life not through Miyamoto's work, but rather in the form of Mr. Game & Watch, the simple silhouette of a rubber-limbed man who would go on to star in countless of Gunpei Yokoi's LCD Game & Watch handhelds throughout the early 80s and eventually gain his own fan following through Smash Bros. Mr. Game & Watch proved remarkably versatile in large part due to his lack of detail. He was simply a stick figure with a penchant for comical poses. Mario, on the other hand, took on a more specific form. Short, paunchy, mustachioed, dressed in blue-collar work clothes. In time, though, despite his more defined nature, Mario soon began to live out his creator's original vision anyway. He became more than just Mr. Video, yet fulfilled his original mandate as an all-purpose, plug-and-play character actor. Mario first appeared as a heroic construction worker in Donkey Kong, but for his next turn, he took on the role of a villainous circus master. Mario Brothers saw him and his brother Luigi working as hapless plumbers, and on Game & Watch, Mario came off as the world's most unstable career man, working in factories, as a fireman, in the army, and more. While we associate Mario with Miyamoto, in truth, the character worked more as a public domain figure inside Nintendo during the first half of the 80s. It wouldn't be until Super Mario Bros. in September 1985 that Mario as we know him today truly took shape. The high-bounding platform hero who grows in size, snatches coins, flings fire, and hunts for stars in the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario would continue to be all things to all people at Nintendo. Hero, sportsman, referee, breakout paddle pilot. But once Super Mario arrived, his physical appearance and personality ceased to be so malleable. Prior to Super Mario Bros. and the establishment of the classic Mario iconography, however, there was no Mario canon per se. The character basically served at the pleasure of many different creators as the needs of their current project dictated. Hence all the Mario cameos in many early NES games, which culminated in a sense here in the form of Wrecking Crew. Wrecking Crew stands as one of the more fascinating chapters of the Mario saga, and as a noteworthy NES creation in general. For starters, this would be Mario's final outing as a workaday career hunter before he found his true calling as a picaresque hero in Super Mario Bros. Of course, as per usual for this era, Mario merely serves as a presence here, a familiar face in a setting that has nothing to do with the character himself. This Mario doesn't jump, evades rather than flings fireballs, and doesn't collect invincibility stars. About the only thing connecting this Mario to his modern canonical self is the fact that he wields a hammer here, as in Donkey Kong. But this hammer is no weapon, and at best can merely surprise a bad guy. No, it's a tool, used strictly for demolition. Where Mario made his debut as a construction worker, assembling a high-rise building that would buckle under the fury of a gorilla kidnapper, here he plays the inverse of that former role. His task is to clear out unwanted objects and debris from 100 different screens unmaking some other carpenter's hard work, or perhaps even his own, who knows? Even more poorly to find here is Luigi, who literally appears as Mario's duplicate all the way down to the colors of his outfit. The advent of Luigi and Mario Brothers a year and a half prior to Wrecking Crew's debut gave the alternating two-player mode its own distinct names, besides Player 1 and Player 2, but that's literally as far as Nintendo had made it in terms of defining these characters. The visual and conceptual dissonance of Wrecking Crew's presentation gives it an ersatz feel, like some odd arcade bootleg. That couldn't have been further from the truth, though. On the contrary, this was produced by key Nintendo personnel. Besides having its producer in Gunpei Yokoi, who had also supervised the development of the previous Mario titles, including Mario Brothers, Wrecking Crew's main designer was Yoshio Sakamoto, who would direct Metroid, and future Super Mario Land director Satoru Ukata directed it. Finally, many sources credit Hirokazu Hip Tanaka as the game's composer, and certainly it bears the trademark jauntiness of his musical style.
In short, Wrecking Crew serves as another early instance of the different internal divisions at Nintendo riffing on a concept in their own distinct ways. Ice Climber, Wrecking Crew, and Super Mario Bros. all offer three wholly unique answers to the question of, how do you follow up a game like Mario Bros.? Of course, Super Mario Bros. would prove to be the most influential and popular answer, and such is that game's success and influence that it's hard to imagine any other answer. But it wasn't so clear-cut at the beginning of 1985. At that point, side-scrolling platformers were a very new, and honestly not so impressive, concept. Pac-Land had brought the American Pac-Man cartoon into pixel form, but it felt awkward, not like the dawn of a major new genre, in part because Namco used a two-button system for Pac-Man's lateral movement, like Space Invaders, despite the fact that the original Pac-Man had cemented the joystick as the default arcade controller. Both Ice Climber and Wrecking Crew feel like logical incremental expansions on the Mario Bros. concept. They took the single-screen action design of that game and added vertical scrolling while focusing on different elements. Ice Climber, of course, centered on jumping and cooperative action. Wrecking Crew, on the other hand, attempted to wed the Mario Bros. structure to the puzzle platformer design that was so common to the era. Perhaps not surprisingly, Wrecking Crew shared some staff in common with that of Gyromite, a puzzle platformer that would arrive a few months later. Clearly, Nintendo's R&D 1 team had an interest in puzzle action. In this case, the puzzle mechanics revolved around the fact that Mario needed to clear each screen of unwanted walls and structures. That sounds easy enough in concept, but past the first few stages, Wrecking Crew's level designs become intricate and interlocked, with destructible elements that also serve as platforms and ladders to otherwise unreachable objects. You can only move along to the next stage once you clear the current level of all destructible elements, be it panels, brick walls, or cement ladders. Completing most stages of Wrecking Crew requires a certain amount of planning, or else you'll end up with a handful of inaccessible items that prevent you from advancing. The game allows you to cancel out of a stage with the press of a button, but doing so resets your lives and scores. So if you become stuck, the only way to avoid starting over is to allow the fireball to kill you. As in Mario Bros., a fireball flies in from the edge of the stage at certain intervals. Since Wrecking Crew wasn't an arcade game, outside of the inevitable Versus system release, the fireball works less here as a way to keep quarter drops brisk, and more like a puzzle element to bear in mind. Or, of course, as a handy suicide pill in a worst case scenario. The fireball isn't the only hazard present in Wrecking Crew. You also have to contend with three different enemies, wrenches, eggplants, and Foreman Spike. Yes, eggplants again. This isn't even the last we'll see of them. Someone at Nintendo was clearly a big fan. These three dangers may not seem like much to worry about, but within the game's limited space, they pose ample danger. Wrenches tend to be predictable, following Mario to the best of their ability wherever they can find a path. They'll chase him across platforms and up and down ladders, slowly but persistently. It's not too difficult to fool them, but their inexorable march makes them a constant lurking danger as you navigate the stages. Their limited AI can also cause them to become stuck in loops that prevent you from progressing or clearing a stage, so you have to watch out for that. Wrenches appear in two different colors, though the only difference between the two variants appears to be the speed at which they move. Eggplants are much more dangerous for their sheer unpredictability. They seem to have no real interest in Mario per se, but they dash blindly throughout each stage and move up and down ladders on a whim. One eggplant is usually no trouble to deal with, but when several appear at once, things can get pretty dicey. Because their movements seem so haphazard and random, staying clear of their erratic movements can be difficult. And finally, there's Form and Spike. Where bumping into a wrench or eggplant will cause Mario to lose a life, Spike doesn't actually hurt Mario directly. Instead, he moves around in the background plane of the action, shadowing Mario's movements to the best of his ability. If he catches up to Mario while both characters are standing in front of a destructible object, he'll attempt to smash the scenery before Mario can. If he's faster on the draw, the shock of his demolition will send Mario plummeting to the lowest level of the stage, similar to detonating one of the bombs that sometimes appears within the stages. The reverse is also true, though. You can send Foreman Spike plunging to the floor if you can crush a wall before he does. The indirect nature of the threat Spike poses, and his ability to break the scenery just like Mario can, makes him by far the most devious and complex element of the game. Spike can completely spoil a run through a level by, say, knocking Mario off a platform that can't be reached again from the bottom of the screen, or worse, by smashing a destructible ladder while Mario is climbing it. Some later puzzles involve exploiting Spike's behavior by causing him to knock Mario to the lower portion of a stage that can't be reached any other way. Wrecking Crew has a pretty simple premise and a very limited sandbox, but its designers explored pretty much every possible aspect of the game's mechanics in the course of its hundred stages. And for those who find the game's advanced challenges, like very precisely outracing enemies in a very linear maze, disappointing, 
Wrecking Crew is also one of the three entries in Nintendo's programmable series. As with Excite Bike, you can design multiple stages of your own using the full palette of options available to the original design team. And as with Excite Bike, Japanese Famicom owners had the opportunity to save their creations to tape, a feature included in the US ROM but never put to use. As mentioned before, Wrecking Crew also saw a Versus System release for whatever that was worth. Nintendo reissued the game on Famicom Disk System in 1988 along with many other early Famicom releases, but this game's reissue lacked any notable alterations besides, naturally, the option to save your level creations to diskette rather than tape. Still, that wasn't the end for Wrecking Crew. The game has been reissued numerous times in the past decade or so, including on Virtual Console, however it also received a Japan-only sequel for Super Famicom called Wrecking Crew 98. As the title suggests, it appeared at the very, very end of the system's life and originally showed up as a download-only release for rewritable carts, though it did eventually get a limited retail release. Likely due to its incredibly late publication date, Nintendo never bothered to release it outside Japan, though it would probably work quite nicely as a virtual console title, intent Nintendo. Wrecking Crew 98 is a pretty strange follow-up though, despite what the name might imply, it's not a remake, but in fact a full sequel, and in every way a completely different game. Rather than playing as an 80s style puzzle platformer, Wrecking Crew 98 plays as a 90s style falling block platformer, vaguely like Panel de Pong. Mario smashes multicolored wall modules while trying to line them up into advantageous arrangements, sending garbage blocks over to his opponent and vice versa. Aside from featuring Mario with a hammer and the presence of the original Wrecking Crew foes, including Foreman Spike, which shoots down rumors Spike was actually Wario, Wrecking Crew 98 has very little to do with the NES game. Still, it does add a touch of extra legitimacy to this strange hiccup in Mario's history. Wrecking Crew had barely any breathing room in Japan before Super Mario Bros. arrived and redefined the character forever. And of course it showed up day and date with Super Mario in the US. As such, it feels like a bit of an orphan in Nintendo's history, the final Mario game before the character's true canon was established once and for all. But it's really less of an oddity than many people seem to think. It has a direct creative through line to the original Mario Brothers, and most of the Wrecking Crew team would get together again in a few years to produce Mario's portable debut, Super Mario Land. That game is pretty weird too, but R&D1's work with Mario would go on to prove that weirdness wasn't a defect in R&D1's Mario adventures, it was actually kind of the selling point. So bask in the weirdness of Wrecking Crew and enjoy what amounts to a pretty darn good puzzle platformer, won't you? Next on Good Intentions, Jackie Chan, for real. <laughs> 